everyone. I'm Donna Martinez. Welcome to another edition of Shaftesbury Society, coming to you live from the headquarters of the John Locke Foundation in Midtown Raleigh. Hope you are well. You're having a good Monday. Boy, you have tuned in for something that's really special today. We have an incredible team. Our Locke Foundation team members, Carolina Journal involved as well today. We're going to be talking about the power of innovation. So think about this, where would we all be today without the risk takers, without the dreamers in society? Imagine a world without this computer, the one that you are sitting in front of right now, or with this type of phone. This phone is central to all of us. Um, how would we get through the day without the access that the phone provides us? Well, with, there are so many other innovations, products and services that fuel our on-demand society. But innovations don't occur in a vacuum. The ideas that improve our lives are often subject to government regulations, and in some case, cases, too many regulations. So how do we make sure that these products and services make it into the marketplace without being overburdened by too much government? They need support, not barriers. So today, we're going to give you an update on a number of the different innovations across a variety of public policy areas that the Locke Foundation is working to urge lawmakers to adopt. Joining me today are my colleagues Brooke Medina. She is the Vice President of Communications here at Locke. Brian Balfour is the Senior Vice President of Research at Locke. Ray Nothstein is the opinion editor at Carolina Journal. Jordan Roberts is government affairs associate for the Locke Foundation. And John Gose is senior fellow in legal studies here at Locke. Folks, thanks for joining me today. I've really been looking forward to this. I appreciate all of you giving us uh, the time today. Brooke and Brian, I'd really like to start with you if we could and talk about the uh, situation with the financial services sector and uh, making sure that all these new products and services really can make it into the marketplace. And Brooke, you wrote a really interesting piece about cryptocurrency. Now, Bitcoin, I know, is the one that is, we're probably most familiar with, but help us understand about cryptocurrency. Yes, well, thank you for having me, Donna. And cryptocurrency is, uh, it is a an alternative to our US dollar or fiat currency that is issued by various governments. Um, it is, of course, global rather than just a national currency. And it is it, it exists on something called the blockchain. And so it's like a digital ledger rather than having these uh, dollar backed uh, means of exchange. It is a way to digitally exchange for various products and goods. And of course, like you mentioned, Bitcoin is one of those options. There are others like Litecoin, Erythium, um, Dogecoin, which is an Elon Elon Musk one, and uh, of course that one's been declining as of late. But these are uh, it is an anti-inflationary, or it is a let's say a hedge around the inflationary um, reactions that often happen with fiat currency as the government continues to print more and more money and inject it into the economy, uh, as many people can attest, they're going to the grocery stores, for example, and they're realizing that they're paying more for their products. Well, cryptocurrency is another option. Uh, oftentimes, Walmart, for example, probably won't accept it yet, but it's an option uh, that is there to mitigate some of the inflationary waves that we experience when we're utilizing currency backed by the Federal Reserve. So, Brian, in some ways it sounds really exciting, but I would imagine, like I was talking to some family members about this a couple weeks ago, and one of them said, look, you know, that's a little bit too advanced to me. It sounds like a really risky trading in the stock market, and I don't want to have much to do with it. So there's kind of um, a, a phase where people will need to be educated about this, and they're going to need to see a product that really survives in the marketplace uh, in order for people to accept this. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's one of the hallmarks of a, a currency or a, a, a money in a society is that it is a commonly accepted medium of exchange. So what we're seeing in terms of uh, cryptocurrency that Rick was talking about is, is this kind of gradual uh, and growing acceptance amongst more and more people who are, you know, kind of taking the plunge and, and learning a little bit more about it and, and trying to, and, and more and more, uh, establishments will being willing to accept it uh, as, as a means of payment as well. So that's really, um, I, I think, uh, uh, 
the biggest way for it to establish itself is just for people to continue to get exposed to it, to learn more about it and to begin using it. Um, because then, then, and only then can it start to begin to compete in the marketplace with, you know, the, the, the official U.S. dollar. And in fact, uh, one of the um, issues that the Locke Foundation has been helping to educate lawmakers about and urge them to, to think about really seriously has to do with the regulatory environment around these types of insurance products or financial products to make sure that they've got some guideposts there um, as they develop, but that they're not just buried by rules and regulations and, and really can't get the start that they need. Tell us what's happening with what's called a regulatory sandbox. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, innovation and technology can move so fast these days, uh, especially in the financial sector, banking, insurance, uh, you know, some of these things that we're alluding to. Uh, but so many states, their regulatory frameworks are just not established with those kind of innovations in mind. So we have these new uh, products, these new innovations coming online, being introduced by these companies, but states just don't know how to regulate them um, and, and actually a lot of the regulations that are on the books are really prohibitive and, and prohibiting these uh, new companies or innovations from uh, uh, bringing, you know, coming to the marketplace. So this regulatory sandbox, this is a type of legislation which basically allows these new innovations uh, a temporary amount of time to uh, have, have waivers and, and uh, not be restricted by a lot of these regulations in these states until some more informed uh, objective regulations can be applied to them and, and appropriate to the, to the new advancement. And actually here in North Carolina, uh, they passed a regulatory sandbox bill, uh, House Bill 624 just last week. So it's currently sitting on Cooper's desk, Governor Cooper's desk. Uh, we're pretty confident that he's gonna go ahead and sign it, but this bill uh, focuses primarily on uh, uh, finance and banking and insurance products, uh, as well as some of that digital currency and blockchain technology that Brooke was talking about earlier. So that's, um, you know, that's that's going to, I think, a great opportunity to allow for for more innovation to come to North Carolina. And just um, North Carolina would be joining uh, six other states that have already passed in the last couple of years have already passed this type of regulatory sandbox for these industries. So it'll be, I think it'll be really, it's really forward looking for North Carolina to do this, to continue to attract and be a great place to attract uh, new upcoming and innovative companies. And in fact, folks, um, what Brian was just referring to about the bill that was passed now sits on Governor Cooper's desk. There's a great story at carolinajournal.com about this. So if you wanna catch up on exactly what this is, what's in the bill, and uh, what it would do, go to carolinajournal.com. You can read it there. Also, I believe my colleague, uh, Brene Goforth, is gonna be posting in the comments section of our Facebook page. If you're watching us on Facebook, a link to this story so you can access that really easily. You know, the, the issue of success in other places, I think, is an interesting one. But you mentioned half a dozen states, but are there areas, Brian, even around the world where perhaps countries are really taking the lead in this type of advancement on uh, financial products to serve a very different and changing global marketplace? Yeah, I, I don't. I haven't really done a lot of research uh, globally. Uh, my focus was more on other states. Uh, uh, I here, think South Korea the has, has done some work on this as well. I think our colleague John Sanders has, has written a little bit yeah. about that. Uh, the state of Utah apparently um, is taking a lead here in, in the 50. Yeah, the state of Utah has really taken the lead. Um, they've been driving a lot of these policies. They've been sharing their experiences with other states and how they were able to get these uh, bills passed. Uh, in Utah, and all this is really occurring within the last couple of years. Uh, when you start looking at um, other states that have been either introducing bills or actually having passed bills in, in these financial technology uh, innovations, insurance technology innovations, and so forth, it's really taking place in the last couple of years. And I think, you know, we can go back a, a number of years with the introduction of new technologies like Uber and Lyft and and um, uh, Airbnb and these type of companies that were really new to the scene. And again, state regulations really didn't have anything that was appropriate to, to adapt to uh, what these technologies were, were doing and introducing into the marketplace. So, you know, the regulatory sandbox, again, gives these companies, these innovators, 
some time to avoid some of these regulations that otherwise would prevent them from bringing their uh, product to the marketplace uh, until we figure out really what what these uh, companies and innovations are all about. And so we can kind of objectively go about uh, regulating them and, and um, uh, putting some curbs on, on those and, and uh, just allowing them to compete in the marketplace. Brooke, you mentioned Elon Musk. Um, is it gonna take really some, some well-known, very wealthy risk takers who are, who are really pushing the envelope in all sorts of arenas to help uh, Americans, for example, get comfortable with something like this? Well, I certainly think that the role of the influencer in 2021 is, uh, and this whole past decade, it, it should not be underestimated that there are people that can serve as spokespeople, unofficial spokespeople for innovation. And certainly Elon Musk is one of them. But I would say that cryptocurrency in general is becoming much more ubiquitous than Musk's, uh, he has Dogecoin, for example, and that's not uh, performing as well as some of these others. But even so, he is serving as someone who is pushing this conversation forward, testing these limits. And uh, to your point about other countries that are beginning to dabble in this area uh, of financial innovation, I would say for the most part, though, most countries, their knee jerk reaction at the governmental level is to restrict. I mean, China has essentially just outlook outlawed cryptocurrency. Um, El Salvador, I believe, did make it a, 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 a national legitimate means of exchange, but that has, uh, that has brought with it its own sort of complications and challenges. And so it really is in this uncharted territory right now. And so we're figuring out what makes the most sense. But to Brian's point, that is why it's essential to not create too, uh, too narrow of guardrails for regulation on financial innovations like this or insurance innovations, because we just don't know how it's going to evolve. And we know that government can never move nearly as fast as technology can in that spy design, which is why I'm so excited about this regulatory sandbox bill and in hopes that Governor Cooper does actually sign it. It was a bipartisan bill. So the hope is that North Carolina, we are such a welcoming business climate when it comes to uh, various industries. So hopefully this will be another industry that we begin to bring into our fold and our state portfolio. You used an interesting phrase about pushing the envelope and that's really what risk taking and product development, service, service development is all about. But it's that line, you know, and, and with government, government tends to want to step in and take a role. And so we're trying to get lawmakers to resist that urge. And at least with this regulatory sandbox bill, it appears that bipartisan support, they are resisting the urge to kill this thing before it can even get started. Uh, but Brian, that line is always an interesting one because there are risks. There is a, a role for government to play in certain areas to a certain degree in terms of public safety and public health and, and things like that. Um, so how do we talk as free marketers to people who are just very concerned about the risk and, and do want to have government step in and kind of take a very muscular role that would hurt the development of the product? Yeah, well, you know, one thing I would point them to is, is some of the research that we've talked about at the Locke Foundation. Um, in fact, there was a, a 2015 study conducted by the Beacon Hill uh, Institute that, and this was in 2015, that estimated regulations cost North Carolina's economy over $25 billion every year. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's money that's no longer available to be creating jobs to, for companies to be improving and expanding uh, you know, their business to, to improve their products for consumers. So, you know, regulations, once they start getting beyond a certain point and, and, you know, we can debate what that point is, we would lean more towards uh, a, a much more lean kind of regulatory uh, state that's, that's more focused on protecting uh, property rights and enforcing contracts. Um, but, you know, those kind of burdens on businesses, like I said, it, it harms job creation. Uh, it, it, it discourages new business creation because oftentimes these big regulations, sometimes they're put in place at the encouragement of the big businesses because it's the big businesses that can afford these compliance costs and it creates a big uh, barrier to entry for new upstart entrants. Uh, so, you know, there's sometimes, uh, you know, there's a myth that big businesses are all these huge laissez-faire um, 
you know, free market proponents, but oftentimes it's the big businesses that are sitting and writing regulations with the legislators because it's going to put their smaller competition or potential new entrants, uh, you know, potential new competitors at a disadvantage. Oh boy, and, and look no further than the ride sharing uh, vehicles that have, um, that have cropped up or the scooters, remember scooters in several different um, towns across North Carolina, and boy, you have their traditional competitors and local governments then stepping in uh, because the innovation is just a little bit too much for them and they, and they want to go in and control uh, what's happening there. So we really have to talk to people about making sure that you know competition, yes, it is tough. We see it with food trucks and bricks and mortar restaurants, but that's all about serving the consumer and the consumer will make their choices. And so, you know, if you are in the traditional arena, you have to step up and prove your product or your service in order to compete rather than be protected by government. Yeah, exactly right. Certificate of need laws are, are another great example of that with the hospitals where hospitals and, and uh, medical facilities need to get permission from a, a government uh, a council uh, to, to expand. Uh, and, and oftentimes it's those entrenched already big hospitals that have representatives on those, those councils, you know, making the decisions over whether or not their, their competition is going to be allowed to expand or, or uh, you know, acquire new medical devices. So it, it's, um, you know, that it definitely poses a threat when business, big business and, and big government collude with each other. And really who's ultimately harmed is going to be the consumers because we're going to have fewer choices and uh, typically when you have fewer choices, prices uh, grow uh, and, and there's higher prices and, and also workers as well. The, the state becomes less dynamic in terms of economic growth, fewer job opportunities. So, you know, consumers and workers are really bear, bear the brunt of uh, this kind of collusion uh, that generates a lot of this big regulatory state that we're talking about. Brooke, let's look ahead for a moment, if we could. We know that the regulatory sandbox bill that we've been talking about is now awaiting uh, Governor Cooper's decision, and hopefully um, he will sign it. It's a bipartisan piece of legislation. If he does that, does that mean that we're here in North Carolina, there might be an appetite uh, from both major political parties and our governor to consider more, more of these types of, of easing of regulations, perhaps on other industries? We can only hope so. I mean, this is one of those uh, this is one of those opportunities where we get to create a case study whereby we can look at other regulatory frameworks and see does that make sense uh, for that particular industry as well. I mean, one thing we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, for example, was the Trump administration at that time rolled back regulations in the healthcare industry. And that paved the way for telehealth, for example. And so people were still being able to get their health care needs met. And I think that that is an example of how deregulation helps consumers, helps the market. And I think we're applying it now to this financial service industry, but it will serve as a specific North Carolina specific case study as to what deregulation or a little bit more regulatory latitude or smart regulation can do for the state and other industries. Again, North Carolina is only one of six states that's doing this. And so this is going to send a signal to companies that are interested in expanding into the crypto space or crypto mining space, which is a, I've written on that as well in the past. Um, and it will provide a, a, an opportunity for them. It sends an opportunity to these businesses that we are welcoming them here into the state to be able to try out these new ideas and to compete in the marketplace of ideas. And I believe that this is an essential time for them to do it because of the increase in inflation that we're seeing. We're continuing to see public decrease in trust when it comes to uh, the, the power of the dollar, but not even just the power of the dollar. It goes beyond that. I mean, the Chinese are experiencing this this, as well as the European Union. So hopefully we can lead the way and, uh, and other states will join us in the future. I like the way you put that. A nice case study right here in North Carolina. This is going to be exciting to watch. And uh, hopefully then Governor Cooper will sign it. We can have the study and then we can learn about ways that other industries could be impacted to let them grow more naturally and a little bit easier. Brooke Medina and Brian Balfour, thanks for joining us. Appreciate that.
All right, so you heard Brooke and Brian both refer to some issues of medical care and health care. For that, we want to talk with Jordan Roberts, who is our government affairs associate here at the John Locke Foundation. Uh, Jordan also, uh, he used to be the um, health care policy analyst here at Locke, so he has a lot of knowledge in the health care industry. Wanted to talk to him about that today. Jordan, thank you. The big issue right now, as here in North Carolina, we are waiting awaiting the budget negotiations um, between the General Assembly, the leaders there, and Governor Roy Cooper. We know that Governor Cooper has been and continues to be a big advocate for expanding Medicaid here in North Carolina. And apparently that's part of the discussions, we, we think it is. But you have written an excellent piece just to remind folks that whether it was Medicaid expansion a few years ago, talk of that, it was a bad idea then, it's also a bad idea today. Tell us why. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Donna. So yeah, you know, at the Locke Foundation, we continue to believe that Medicaid expansion is a bad deal for North Carolina. Um, in particular, uh, you know, there was this reliance on federal funding, uh, you know, opening up the state to a responsibility of a 10% share of the total cost of Medicaid. Um, you know, we think that uh, poses a real risk of putting the, the budget in jeopardy. And, you know, we've had sound fiscal budgeting for a number of years now. Um, also, the Medicaid expansion and in, in the proponents of it tend to ignore all the supply shortages we have across the state. Um, you know, many of our counties are designated as uh, primary care, um, mental health uh, shortage areas. And so, you know, we put insane, uh, a, a lot, a high amount of pressure um, on the system by increasing demand without doing anything for the supply. But, um, you know, it's really interesting now in 2021 uh, with these budget negotiations. And as I, as I wrote in the piece that you mentioned, um, simultaneously, there is, uh, you know, negotiations going on at the federal level, um, included in uh, President Biden's uh, Build Back Better bill, the reconciliation bill that everyone's talking about. Um, there's a provision in there that uh, the federal government is poised to bypass state authority uh, if, if this provision is in the final bill that, uh, you know, will likely get passed with Democrats having control of the House, Senate and the presidency. So if that provision is in there, uh, it's aimed at states like North Carolina that have chosen not to expand Medicaid. And remember, uh, because of a court, a Supreme Court case back when the Affordable Care Act was passed, it's a choice that states have. But under this new plan, uh, the federal government would essentially bypass state authority and fund uh, met, uh, coverage for the Medicaid expansion population in states that haven't expanded um, at 100%. So, you know, we continue to believe that taking the bait, accepting this federal funding uh, is a bad decision, but even more so now that, you know, in a few years, we might not even have a choice if the, if the federal government and President Biden gets his way. So, you know, for all these reasons, we think that uh, you know, legislative leaders should continue to reject this and look for, uh, like we're going to talk about today, more innovative ways to fix some of the health care problems in North Carolina. The other curious um, component of what's happening in Washington, D.C., Jordan, is that you actually have some leading Democrats and the, and the White House spokesperson saying, don't worry about uh, the big reconciliation bill. It's free. It's zero cost. It won't cost you anything. And of course, you know, that's absolute malarkey, as our president might say. Yeah, absolutely. It's just it's it's just foolish to think that, you know, some something of an undertaking like this would cost zero dollars. I mean, we can raise taxes as much as we want. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's it's federal taxpayers that are going to be paying for this. And, you know, generations after us picking up that that debt, um, you know, that we've racked up to close to 30 trillion now. And in fact, the piece that Jordan is uh, referring to that he wrote about this to remind us all of why this is still a very bad idea, Medicaid expansion, why there are other ways to address some um, issues of access to medical and health care. Uh, you can find it um, in the comments section of our Facebook page. I think we're going to be posting this. But if you go to the locker room, which is at johnlock.org, you can see the piece headline, Potential Federal Legislation Makes Medicaid Expansion an Even Worse Deal for North Carolina. So remember to check in on that. Remind yourself of why when you start hearing about this, it is still a very bad idea for North Carolina. So we're talking about innovations, Jordan, and um, you have been on top of um, 
of urging lawmakers for several years now to adopt some of these innovations to address what are real concerns about access to care and the cost of care. And in fact, right here in our state, we recently have, have um, had some victories related to this government permission slip that's required for hospitals and, and groups of doctors who want to expand or provide an additional type of service. They have to get a state permission slip. It's called certificate of need. But it looks like um, we may have a little bit of a loosening in some areas. That would be great news. Tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, this has been an issue that we've been working on for a number of years. Uh, our preferred position would be to uh, repeal the entire law because it's an antiquated, outdated law that you know has proven time and again to raise prices and limit supply, uh, which is the exact opposite of what the law was intended for. But yeah, we're talking about certificate of need laws. And recently, uh, the governor signed a bill that um, would increase the thresholds for a number of different uh, facilities that if built would trigger a certificate of need review. Um, so, you know, this is great for healthcare entrepreneurs that want to build or expand. Uh, they have more leeway to build without, again, triggering that certificate of need review because it can be a lengthy, expensive, and ultimately, you know, not worthwhile process because there's no guarantee that the state will even sign off on your project. Um, but then the other side, there's another part of the bill too, um, in addition to raising the thresholds. Um, so, I, you know, I'm really not sure if this is just unique to North Carolina, but we're, what we're hearing or what we've heard from a lot of, uh, you know, people around the state is that um, when company, when uh, large health systems, uh, you know, might get a certificate of need for a new facility, uh, sometimes they sit on that certificate and they don't actually start building the facility. And so it's sort of a, a, an anti-competitive defense mechanism. And so... Uh, what this bill would do, um, you know, within a reasonable time frame is sort of put a shot clock on these new projects to say, if you go through the process of getting a certificate of need, then you need to actually build that project and not sit on it delay. Because at the end of the day, that hurts, uh, the, you know, the competitors that could be providing care in this area, but it also hurts the patients because, you know, they're, the state uh, gives gives acts or um, permission to build those facilities. But if they're if they're not built, then they're certainly not meeting the need that the state determines, which we continue to believe is uh, much less than the need that's actually out there. So we're very happy that, uh, you know, the bill got through. Again, we would like to see some more reform, but this is a great step. And, you know, we'll open up the market with just a little bit more. I'm so glad you brought up the issue of um, an entity receiving a certificate of need, of getting the permission slip, but then sitting on it, because that's a classic example of how overregulation can be used to protect the business that's already in the industry and to prevent anyone else from coming in who would be competition for them, essentially. Um, and that's a barrier that we really should be rolling back. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we talk about you know, healthcare shortages, access shortages all over the state. And, you know, I think one of the main things that certificate of need uh, laws prevent uh, in, in in, uh, on the topic of our discussion today is innovation. And, you know, we continue to believe at the Locke Foundation that having uh, coverage, health insurance coverage, doesn't always equal access to care. You actually have to have the physical supply on the ground. And, you know, I, rem I remember reading an article a while back, uh, maybe a year or two ago in the Washington Post about this really, I think, you know, what's going to be the future of rural health care, but it was a remote emergency room. And so essentially you had doctors in one location, I believe it was in South Dakota, uh, sitting in front of screens and rural health centers uh, around, around the country uh, when, when someone would come in and they were, uh, you know, understaffed or didn't have the means to treat that patient, uh, they would use telehealth to uh, talk directly with this remote emergency room that would, you know, give them in real time uh, directions on how to treat these patients. And, you know, again, with that's the type of innovation that we're talking about that, you know, could really break the status quo in rural health care. But again, these certificate of need laws are hindering that potential innovation. There's probably a lot of ideas like that that, you know, we just don't even know about yet. So, yeah, I mean, it all works together. And again, that physical supply of health care, just it's hard to understate how important that is. And oddly enough, it's been COVID-19 and this pandemic that has really seemed to have jump started the issue of telemedicine and telehealth for obvious reasons. People's mobility limited, but you still have medical issues. In fact, I know my health insurance um, carrier 
sends me an email every now and then just saying, hey, have you signed up for this yet? Uh, because we think it's a, something that you would want to use. So in terms of telemedicine and telehealth and what you've seen during the pandemic, are there steps that North Carolina could be taking to try to even expand the access and the use of um, telemedicine here in our state so that more people then potentially, again, can see a doctor or a specialist that they may not be physically near to, but who could really help them uh, using this technology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, so we, I think the first thing is we continue to be stand against any type of insurance mandates that tries to, you know, get, again, get involved and regulate the use of this, uh, this technology. It's grown organically over the years. And, you know, a, a major catalyst of that was the, the pandemic. And so, you know, we think this is something that, you know, government should really keep their hands off of, let it grow organically, let people get, become more comfortable with it, allow benefit plans to really, you know, how, how they properly see fit, uh, incorporate that into better, into insurance plans. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. And then on the second, this, on this, on the flip side, you know, we think that there, there really could be some liberalization of uh, the licensure um, aspect of this, because, you know, I've always said telemedicine's greatest uh, advantage is that you can connect people over great distances, but uh, currently our licensure laws really limit the amount of providers that North Carolinians can see. So we were supportive of a bill this year, um, House Bill 868, that would, uh, you know, it, it would uh, allow for some licensure reciprocity, make sort of this special telehealth license that if you are licensed in another state, you could have an expedited process to be able to treat North Carolinians, uh, you know, from your state. Otherwise, you would have to go through an entire, uh, to get the North Carolina license, the entire process. And so we think that's really redundant and repetitive and that limits access. So, you know, I think we're only scratching the surface of this. So we should really open it up uh, to allow, you know, any type of healthcare provider, whether that be a general practitioner, uh, psychologist, um, psychiatrist, you know, really anything that, you know, uh, people want to get care for that, you know, they may prefer to get over, um, virtual means, uh, they should do that. And so I think, you know, again, talking about uh, regulations, limiting in innovation, and we think uh, these type of occupational licensure, licensing laws, and, you know, uh, our colleague John Sanders has written all about the, the problems with occupational licensing, but especially in the healthcare space, we tend to restrict so much uh, of, of what practitioners can do that, you know, one way to increase access, again, not necessarily coverage, but just access in general, uh, is, is with these licensure laws. And Jordan, it's not just with licensure laws. That's a, that's a key issue, but also you have been um, writing a lot about making sure that medical professionals are allowed to use the skills, use all of the skills that they have, let them practice at the top of their skill set. And sometimes just the way things work, um, that isn't allowed. Tell us about this. Yeah, so again, an issue that we've been uh, very supportive of for a number of years now it comes down, it's a uh, full practice authority for um, the North Carolina's advanced practice registered nurses. Um, there's a bill that's introduced every year called the SAVE Act. And what this bill would, uh, would do is remove a lot of these restrictions that require nurses to uh, have a supervising physician um, and, you know, really just modernize the regulations to make it uh, in law, what nurses can and can't do based on uh, the training that they receive. And so, you know, again, talking about that physi physician shortage around the country, around our state, uh, you know, it's this is not uh, just unique to North Carolina. Um, you know, there's projections that show by 2033, we're going to have about uh, 139,000 uh, physician uh, number of uh, physician shortages in this country. So we're going to really have to look to our workforce and be able to utilize uh, the current workforce we have. Uh, the nursing pr practice is growing, physician practice is shrinking, and so we need to, we don't need to limit what nurses can do. And again, with these collaborative practice agreements, these supervising physicians, uh, there's no real supervision going on. There's a piece of paper that's signed. Uh, once every or twice a year, the physician, the supervising physician doesn't even have to be in the same uh, facility, county, or even state we've heard examples of. And so, you know, what this does is it geographically limits where nurses can practice. And if we really care about, you know, rural health, we should allow 
are, are you know, in primary care, especially uh, in allowing nurse practitioners to practice without, uh, you know, the supervising physician. And, you know, we've seen studies that can, that, that can increase in rural, rural areas, and that's a, a big concern here in North Carolina. So we think this is a really easy reform um, allowing, uh, you know, nurses to really go out on their own, uh, highly trained nurses, highly qualified nurses to go out on their own um, and set up their own practices and maybe even, you know, come up with new innovative ways to treat different communities. And Jordan, those of us who live in the metropolitan areas um, in a growing state like North Carolina may not really even realize that there actually are, you have documented this, there's lots of statistics about it, there are areas of our state where people really do not have access to the medical care that they need. Hard to believe in 2021, but that is a reality. And it seems like there would be bipartisan support to try to close that access gap. And it seems like we could do this with simply changing the law to allow these people who are highly skilled nurses to go where the need is. Yeah, and, and just as we talk about so much in occupational licensing, it really comes down to a turf war and a lot of uh, interest using the state to sort of protect their own uh, their own uh, patch of turf. So, you know, we're hoping to break through that. The SAVE Act had more sponsors this year than any year before, Republicans and Democrats uh, standing together saying, yes, this is a simple fix. Um, and so, you know, we're hoping with the momentum that we've been building for a number of years, working with a number of other stakeholder groups that believe this, this is a, a, a common sense and easy reform to do. And again, North Carolina is one of, I believe, 11 states that still require super, supervision requirements on nurse practitioners. And you know, similar numbers of states have uh, you know, got rid of this law for the other APRN professions. So we're behind the curve on this. And this would be, you know, uh, I think a really easy fix for a lot of the problems in, in our healthcare system to at least attempt to address them. Because like you said, it's either uh, no healthcare or healthcare that some may think is inadequate just based on training. But, you know, it's not, it, we know the fact that, you know, nurses provide ad, uh, equal to uh, or even better care sometimes uh, than, than physicians in these circumstances. So, you know, we think, you know, we should utilize all the healthcare professionals that we have in the state and utilize them to their highest potential. And folks, uh, this is what we're talking about when we're saying less government, more innovation. This is the approach that we are urging lawmakers to take when it comes to expanding access to care, not getting government more involved through expanding Medicaid, for example, but taking what we already have, relying on the skilled professionals who are in the industry, giving them the ability to really go out, go where the, the gaps are, go where the care is needed to expand access to care to improve the lives of North Carolinians. Jordan Roberts has been writing about this extensively. You can always read his work at johnlock.org. Jordan, thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for having me, Donna. So we've also been focusing on the issue of public safety. That is very important to every single one of us. It's in the news a lot today, of course. And joining us to talk about some of the innovations and the data related to public safety uh, innovations are two of my colleagues. John Guze is the senior fellow in legal studies here at the Locke Foundation. And Ray Nothstein is the opinion editor editor at Carolina Journal. John and Ray, thanks for being here. Let's talk first about some of these really alarming statistics that have been in the news the past few days, and uh, you've been writing about these. Crime is up, and this is per FBI statistics. John, give us a sense of, of what is happening in this country. Well, a couple of weeks ago, the FBI released their unified crime reports for 2020. And it confirmed what we'd all been expecting because there'd been, uh, it's, everybody sees it in the news, homicides are way up, almost 30% over 2019, which is the largest year over year increase since the FBI started keeping track of these things. Uh, other violent crimes are up too, um, but the homicide is the one that is really alarming. Uh, it's important to keep an eye on it, firstly, because it's so dreadful, it involves actual murders, but also because this is the, data that is most accurate. It's most likely to be reported. And um, I think that's the barometer that we should always be watching. So it's, it's extremely upsetting uh, in all kinds of ways, but it shows something that I think we lost sight of a little bit, which is that crime is a problem and it's continued to be a problem ever since um, the huge uh, late 20th century crime wave of the 60s, 70s and 80s. 
crime went down, but it didn't go down to where it was in the 50s. And it continued to be a huge problem, especially in certain communities, African-American communities, poor communities, and it's caused terrible problems. We need to do more about it. So whereas the other panelists today have been talking about things that where government should get out of the way, let people innovate. There's one thing the government should do. I think we all agree about that, and that is protect public safety. And in fact, John, you wrote um, a really fascinating research report um, about this whole issue of policing and public safety. Uh, and I would remind folks that you can read it at johnlock.org, Keeping the Peace Through Intensive Community Policing by John Guzay. Um, Ray, you have been writing and talking about this issue of the FBI crime report as well. And you've said, look, you know, this is this data, we can't ignore it. We've got to make sure that it's this data that informs our policy choices. How should we move forward, uh, in your opinion, Ray? Well, John uh, is a great resource on this. I mean, he's written much more extensively on the importance of police. And I think uh, that's really the trajectory that we need. Like he said, I mean, we need to enforce public safety. I mean, that's one of the first principles of government is to protect the, the common good and allow people to flourish and live in a virtuous society. And police force are an important role in that. And you know, I think he's exactly right that we need to add more trained law enforcement. One of the things that's interesting is this was a big uh, campaign promise of Democrats uh, under Bill Clinton, of course, if you remember that. I think most of our viewers will remember his campaign. He called for 100,000 more police on the street. Uh, governors and mayors in Democratic uh, deep blue areas, even back then, were very supportive of uh, then candidate Clinton to add more police. And now we have different rhetoric. And I think we're seeing the consequences of that at least in the short term. Of course, we have long-term uh, systemic violence in many communities, but in the short term, we're seeing an, an uptick too in um, the murder rate with lawlessness. And I think this is just really unfortunate because it is so preventable. Even in the polling that we did at, at Civitas and now here, we see that most people are supportive of their local police. They're supportive of having an agenda that is gonna go after violent criminals and keep them off the streets. And I think that's really, incumbent upon government to be able to enforce um, the rule of law, but also prevent the rule of law. And you need police communities doing that. You need them to be active in the community. You need them to be well-trained, well-compensated. We've had a lot of focus on teacher pay across North Carolina, but maybe not enough focus on the pay of law enforcement and how they have risked their job. We've had several um, state troopers, uh, highway patrol in this state who have been basically assassinated. Several have been paralyzed. And uh, we need to have more preventative nature to protect law enforcement and to also to obviously protect the communities that they're serving. You know, John, uh, it's no secret the last, what, year and a half, two years or so, there's been a lot of talk around this country about defunding the police. And in fact, in, in your report about intensive community policing, um, your first recommendation is the opposite, to hire more police officers. Right. Uh, I think everybody, almost everybody now, a few people are clinging to it, but a lot of people on the left and a lot of Democrats are trying to cycle away from this defund the police idea because it just makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense to anybody. It's, it's a loser at the polls. They're going to be looking for something else. And I think intensive community policing is where they ought to pivot to. And it's important to remember a couple things about it. One is that it it's compared to most countries in the world, and especially most of our industrialized uh, peers, the United States is under policed that we have been for a long time. We spend less per capita. Uh, we have fewer police officers per capita than our peer countries. And that's part of the reason why crime has been higher here than in other countries. What people forget though, is it's also part of why incarceration rates are higher here. The, the data over the last five or 10 years has just been overwhelmingly clear. More police results in less crime. And when there's less crime, everybody benefits, not just the potential victims, but the potential criminals too. If they make a different decision at the crucial moment, don't commit that crime, they've got all kinds of better opportunities in life. So everybody left and right, I think, ought to be able to get on board this once they sort of get the idea here. We're talking about a, uh, uh, an approach to public safety where everybody wins, but it's going to require spending the money to put more police on the street. You know, I'm wondering, it, is, there, is there a way to bridge the, the debate 
over this issue of police in our country. Are there things, innovations in training, for example, of police officers upon which we could all agree just make sense, whether it's some um, police officers or in some cases the police unions that represent them, that there are, and, and people who may have a negative view of police and people who have a positive view. Is there that coming together area to innovate in training in order to improve the situation, improve the respect for police, and improve the safety in, in neighborhoods? You know, what one of the things that breaks my heart is to think of neighborhoods and communities that have very high crime rates where you have a lot of law-abiding citizens living there. They may be of modest income or high income, but, but what the characteristic that's important is that they abide by the law and they are subjected to the others in their community who want to break the law and create havoc um, in an unsafe situation for them. It seems like across the ideological and political aisle, we should be able to say, hey, can't we come together on something to protect these law-abiding people who don't deserve this? Well, I certainly think that's right. Uh, we, we've been putting far too much of our effort. It, this is a problem in this country. We tend to get involved in these moral panics where everybody focuses on one sometimes very small thing to the exclusion of much more important issues. And I am afraid that's happening now when it comes to policing. We should be focusing on the victims. There are probably going to be four or 5,000 more people die this year than ought to die, than have died in a typical year from homicide alone. Many of those people are innocent bystanders, and far too many of them, hundreds of them, are just innocent children. I mean, that should be where our focus is, and everybody, I think, can agree upon that. And so I'm not sure, I mean, training will help, no question. We can improve police training. We can uh, improve police management. There's lots of things that are worth working on. And there's lots of people in the criminal justice reform area that are making proposals and have been working on this for years. But the most important thing of all is simply more police. Police presence deters crime. Deterring crime, everybody wins. Ray, one of the things that you write about a lot is the issue of, of gun rights and kind of the, the societal view right now by some that guns are the problem. Um, tell us where you think we stand and, and the role of the gun conversation in the public safety conversation that we're having in this country. Yeah, I think the most important thing in understanding that is more gun control. All it does is deter law abiding citizens. And look, I mean, there's been a lot of focus on police uh, killing uh, alleged criminals or uh, other citizens in communities, but gun uh, owners are the largest, uh, you know, to, for lack of a better word, but killers and may not be intending to kill anybody, but killers of criminals and they have the right to protect themselves. And so anytime you have gun control laws, all it does is help the criminals. And so I think that's really where you, we need to start looking at is first principles on all issues in the uh, public square and in public life is focusing on first principles. And the Bill of Rights gives a broad meaning to the people to arm themselves, to have freedoms to defend themselves. The legislature here is trying to expand that. And of course, you have special interest groups and groups on the left trying to go the other route to take guns away from law-abiding citizens or to make it harder to access a firearm. I mean, in North Carolina, I think this is an important point and that anybody who's still with us needs to understand. North Carolina has not had any movement much, and partly this is because Governor Cooper, but there's even before with Governor McCrory and the North Carolina supermajority of Republicans, they have not had any movement on expanding the Second Amendment, while other states have had a lot of movement, especially that are more aligned politically with North Carolina. We still have a Jim Crow law, a pistol permit law, that it, only up nine other states have. I mean, we're more aligned in some respects with California and the state of New York than we are with uh, even a New England state like uh, New Hampshire or Vermont. So I think that's just important to note that there hasn't been any movement here in North Carolina to expand gun rights. So the General Assembly has done some stuff recently. They've repealed the pistol permit. It was vetoed by Governor Cooper. But overall, I mean, we're kind of in a, a status quo area here in the state with uh, the governor. And so I think it's important really on this issue to just look at first principles, study the data. I mean, we just talked about the FBI crime report, right? I mean, the crime report, we hear a lot about assault rifles in the media and mass shootings with assault rifles, but you're three times, three and a half times more likely to be killed by a knife in America than by in a rifle or an assault rifle or whatever you deem it. So I think it's important to just uh, go and look at the facts, 
but also to always, always go back to first principles in our Bill of Rights and to really ask the question, which I think is important, is that what is our capacity for self-government? Because our capacity for self-government in a way says that we are of a higher plane than the leaders over us, that they're really the servants. And if we start taking away the rights that we're given in the Bill of Rights and we're saying we're inferior to the people that govern us. So it's to me, it's really a self-government issue and a capacity for self-government and, and what we believe about ourselves. And I think in North Carolina, how do we feel about if, you know, let's say Georgia or South Carolina or Mississippi or Alabama or Tennessee has uh, better gun laws for uh, Second Amendment supporters? Uh, are, are we less deserving than those people? Why, why in North Carolina are we not uh, able to have constitutional carry or why are we not to be able to re repeal the pistol permit process? Um, and those states don't have an uptick in crime. It just seems to me we need to ask those uh, questions about are we able to govern ourselves? You know, Ray, you just said something fascinating. And John, I think this really um, relates to some of the work that you've done on the issue of policing um, in your report about intensive community policing and the need to hire more police office officers. Ray said, you know, it gets to what we believe about ourselves. And John, I, I think of that again when I think about the people who are um, su subjected to crime because you have an interesting section in your report where you delve into the relationship between crime and poverty and how crime devastates a community. Uh, tell us about that. Well, that, I think that is very important. People don't take this seriously enough. Uh, there's, a, there's a common tendency to think that, well, maybe poverty is the cause of crime. People commit crimes because they're poor and they have no other way to support themselves or their families. But in fact, if you look at the history of this, it's really more the other way around. Crime causes poverty. And the way it does that is it drives away businesses, it discourages investment, it drives away middle-class tax-paying families, and it leaves communities devastated without a source of jobs and employment, welfare dependency, single families, um, homes without fathers. And then you get into a vicious cycle where all those factors lead to more disaffected, unemployed youths hanging around. They get in trouble with the law and the cycle repeats itself and it gets worse and worse. Um, my hope would be that if we can put more police officers on the streets, reduce crime rates, businesses can come back and we can have uh, more investment in these communities, more jobs, and ultimately everybody benefits. Sadly, what happened uh, in 2020 after the death of George Floyd, we had a lot of out of control violence in many cities all over the country. And that's gonna drive, that, that businesses were destroyed. Many of them aren't coming back. So the problem is gonna be even worse than it would have been had it not been for all that violent um, protest. So that makes the job harder, but it doesn't mean we don't or shouldn't do it. We just means we have to do it sooner and we have to do more of it. Yeah, Ray, I mean, not too many businesses are going to want to invest in, in a community that where there is um, crime and where uh, the community doesn't want to come out and go places and do things um, because they are fearful for their safety. So it seems like as a society that that would be one of the, the key issues we would focus on in understanding that this intensive community policing is one way to start addressing that, to get these communities back up on their feet. Yeah, and I think just to the first principles argument again, I mean, look, if you can't protect property, then you're right. People are going to flee. Uh, business owners are going to flee. If you can't, as a government, go in and secure property and really secure life on top of that, then people are going to flee. And, and we're seeing the unintended consequences of that, where you have more rapid uh, crime and urban decay, which was uh, you know, a, a big problem in the 80s. You saw New York City and in other American cities, you had a lot of urban decay and violence and the broken windows uh, theory. If that starts happening again, then you have big corporations and small businesses who are the largest employer pulling out of communities. And it, create, it creates a chain effect where just uh, more people suffer, more families suffer, people lose their jobs. Um, then there's more, um, you know, younger and affluent people, again, leaving cities like you had in parts of the country in the 70s and 80s. And it creates a catastrophic uh, nightmare for the people that are left behind that can't afford to leave 
or the, the people that um, rely on those industries for employment. So this is a big issue for a lot of governors and mayors in the city. And you're right, John made a good point about a lot of these lawmakers and leaders are backtracking on this issue because uh, unfortunately, I hope they're doing it for the right reasons, not just for the political expediency because it polls so badly that they're doing it from a, a, a system or a thought of principle that we're going to go out and protect our citizenry and protect our property, which the Constitution uh, requires government to do. So I think that's really, it is a huge issue going forward in this country. Ultimately, John, what is it that you would like people to know about what you've laid out in your um, community policing report and what types of innovations do you want people, lawmakers and the general public to start to consider is a way forward to get ourselves out of this rise in crime? Well, it seems a little bit strange to talk about it as an innovation because it's it's both common sense and um, it goes back to what policing used to be in this country. But nevertheless, given the way things have gone, both in the uh, in the in the latter part of the 20th century and more recently, I guess it is kind of innovative to say we need to have police officers on the street, especially in high crime, high disorder neighborhoods, acting as peacekeepers. They're not there to invest just to investigate crimes. They're not there just to catch and punish wrongdoers. They're there to be a a, a presence that discourages crime and encourages good behavior. And if we can get back to that, it's almost an Andy of Mayberry type of approach. I think everybody is going to be much better off. Um, in the paper at the very beginning, I think I quoted an old saying, and I think it applies in the criminal justice area more than anywhere else, really. And that is um, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. It is just so much better if we could deter crime in the first place than having to go after people, catch them, punish them, and try to patch up the damage that they've done to their communities. It's better if the crime doesn't happen in the first place. And again, the report that we're talking about that uh, John has authored is about intensive community policing. And you can see it and read it at johnlock.org. And I think you can also access, access it via a link in the comments section of the Locke Foundation's Facebook page. John Guzay, Ray Nothstein, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, me. Donna. It's always a pleasure. It's been a really interesting conversation today, and I'm hoping that, that what we have brought to you today is a little bit of a pathway forward about some of the things that we are working on here at the John Locke Foundation, things that are being reported on by our journalism arm, Carolina Journal, about ways that we can improve North Carolina, improve your life by getting government to back off a bit, by letting business owners have more freedom to get into the marketplace, by making sure that we have safe and secure communities, by making sure that it's a healthy North Carolina, that those of us who need medical care can get access to the care that we need, and that we innovate, that we allow new products and services to be able to build, to experiment, to expand, and grow without rules that will um, squash them before they can actually uh, develop to their full potential. That's one of the things that we do here, and we talk to lawmakers and help to educate them about a better path forward, because freedom is our mission. We hope that you will follow us. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation. Again, be sure to access all of those links that are in the comments section of the Facebook page. I want to thank my colleagues, Brooke Medina, Brian Balfour, Jordan Roberts, John Guzé, and Ray Nostein. You can read all of their work, carolinajournal.com and johnlock.org. Lastly, I would like to ask you to consider making a financial contribution to all of the work that we've just talked about, the work we're doing here at the John Locke Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization, and we rely on you to fuel our work. If you would like to do that, it's very fast and simple. Just go to johnlock.org in the upper right-hand corner, hit the Donate tab. You can make a secure, financial, tax-deductible contribution to the Locke Foundation right there. It takes less than two minutes to do so. And if you decide that our mission is your mission, and we certainly hope it is freedom, more freedom in North Carolina, that you'll make that donation, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you for watching today. Hope you will join us again next week for another edition of Shaftesbury Society coming to you from the headquarters here in Midtown Raleigh. I'm Donna Martinez. Thanks and have a great week, everybody.